Gasoline Forever. <laughs> Thank you once again, David Preiberger. Apparently, without David Preiberger, I would not have wardrobe. So this is one of Gasoline Forever t-shirts. So if you guys are looking for some merch from somebody that actually has some, not me, obviously, David Preiberger is your guy. Gasoline Forever. Um, tonight, we're going to talk about street boost levels. So the question is, um, <laughs> and I think that this has evolved over, you know, days, months, years, decades, whatever. It has evolved since the early days of turbocharging, obviously. We've had a lot of factory turbo motors, factory blower motors and stuff. But what I'm talking about is because the, the, the factory guys tend to get away with a lot more. My wife's Mercedes is a good example. That thing runs 20 pounds. <laughs> and, and you could put regular gas in it or mid-grade or premium or whatever. Um, I don't I don't think it will run E85 in it. That, that would be interesting to see if there was a tune for that. That would be kind of cool. But my question is, how much boost are guys running on the street? So when I talk about street, obviously, we, ha we have to eliminate some things. We have to eliminate um, drag weak kind of cars. I know that those things are super powerful. And I know, yes, they do technically run on the street. And they drive them to events and trailer stuff behind them. But that's not your typical drag. That's not your typical street car. A, a typical street car is the car that you get in and go drive every day. Well, my Chevy Sprint Turbo was a perfect example. My supercharged Mustang was a perfect example of that. It wasn't just a street car. It was the only one that I had. It's the one that I drove every day. So if that didn't work, that meant I didn't have a way to get around. So that's something that you rely on all the time. So the question is, how much boost do guys run? on these kinds of motors. I know when I was running the Vortex Supercharged Mustang, we ran it at about seven pounds. Now that was, you know, early in the days of five liter Mustang development. It was early in the days of ECU development. I basically had a stock ECU. I had a Pro-M uh, 36 pound calibrated meter. I had 36 pound injectors. And, and, and sometimes I had a crane interceptor, which was like the high, you know, they, they supplied it to me. I, I couldn't buy that. Obviously I couldn't afford it, but they supplied one to me to test because they knew all the crazy stuff that I was doing. So we did a lot of these piggyback kinds of things. So we, you know, what, whatever was the latest we had, a I had an MSD, um, or a crane with, uh, an adjustable timing retard on it so that we could take the timing away way late into that. We started getting into the ability to, to tune the factory ECUs with auto logic and then the other other stuff that came out after that. But all when I was doing all that stuff, it was before that. This was this was the days when the kits came with FMUs and stuff. Um, so FMUs and boost retard to take the timing away or just turn the distributor and run without the timing that you would have normally. Um, all, all of that stuff was early on. But obviously now with the, certainly with the ability to tune, if you look at Matt over at Sloppy, if you look at the ability that they have to tune factory ECUs so that you can go in and change the timing and change the air fuel and change the things that you need when you're running bigger injectors, which you almost always would have to have for certainly for E85, but even for boost, um, I know that, that we had to put bigger injectors in the, in the Mustang engine and in all of the stuff that we run on the engine dyno, obviously, having a standalone is an easy way to go. But even with it, even if you had all that, even if you had the ability to tune it and you had or and or a standalone ECU, which you certainly could, if you're talking about running something on pump gas, because like with the Mustang, I just, like I said, that's something I drove every day. A lot of times I put 87 in it because, because I, but I could stay out of the boost running 87. I knew that, hey, I'm just going to be driving this around for the next couple of weeks or whatever, or I'm taking a long trip up to Northern California, and I'm just going to be driving and cruising on the freeway. No reason for me to have 91. And then also, I could not race somebody if somebody wanted to come up and race. I, I just wouldn't do it. I'm like, hey, hey, look, I'm, I'm trying to be 87. I'm good. I'm just cruising. Um, we'll, we'll get you next time. <clears throat> but the thing is, how much boost are people running with that kind of daily driver mentality. That's something that, because th th then you get, the problem is when you talk to people about what a streetcar is or what a daily is, people's definition of that is different. A daily driver for me is um, 
is the only car that you have. Like for me, that, that the Mustang I had for years and years and years was the only car that I owned. So if it was a car that I would get in, turn the key, put a fill up full of gas. If I had to drive to New York, I would have driven it to New York. Back in the day, I remember talking to my buddy, Bernie Van Hammond, um, and we, we determined that the definition of a real performance street car was a car that you could get in, drive it out to the Silver State, race it at wide open throttle for 40 minutes or 50 minutes or however long it took you to finish the race and then drive it back. A, a real car should be able to do that. <laughs> That's really easy on a, in a brand new Corvette. You can certainly do that in a brand new Corvette or a brand new, mostly anything. All, all of those new cars would do that. But if you were putting together a car, could you put together a car that would actually do that? So that, that's really not the question for tonight, but that gives you an idea of what I'm talking about for the level of streetcar. Not a car that sits in the garage all the time, that gets babied, that gets raced mostly, but you could just go out and drive it on the street if you needed to drive it on the street. I'm talking about a car that you, that that's the car that you take to work every day. That's the car that you drive every day. That's the car that you take your wife out with or your girlfriend or whatever that you, and, and that's the only car that you have sometimes. And that's, that's the daily driver and you have boost on it because you, it didn't come with boost originally, but you put boost on it. You put a junkyard turbo on it or a new turbo or whatever it is. So how much boost is, is, uh, is a daily driving around on pump gas? What, what is the boost level? So if we're going to, that's going to be the poll for tonight. So Okay, so the poll for tonight will be, do daily driven turbo motors, we're going to daily driven pump gas turbo motors run more than 10 pounds? So that'll be our poll for tonight. Do they usually run more than 10 pounds? I get I, you'd be surprised how many times I get asked this question. Hey, can I run seven pounds on whatever, a, an international harvester, a slant six, <laughs> a Honda, <laughs> um, a rotary, whatever it is. I, I get asked that all the time because a lot of people, especially if you've read older turbo books, um, they'll tell you that obviously they tell you all of the terrible things that can happen if you run boost. Oh, you're going to, you know, it's going to run hot. You're going to detonate it. It's going to put a bunch of EGTs and, you know, all of these things. And yet people do it. Now, to be able to go out and run a turbo motor like the Silver State or Le Mans or something like that, um, or the 24 Hours of Lemons, even if you're not running Le Mans, if you're doing the lower price version of that, the Lemons version, um, that's a whole nother thing. It's harder. It's a lot harder to do to make it, to make that last. And, and I, I remember a guy bringing out an RX-7, an RX-7 Turbo 2, which is a really, really cool car, but he wasn't able to keep that thing together for the whole race. Now, I don't think that that specifically has to do with it being a rotary or being a turbo rotary necessarily. It, it could have been a simple tune problem. It could have been a fuel pump. It could have been a lot of different things. I, I don't even know what it was. I just know that I, the thing was fairly fast, but it just it just did not last the whole race. It, it broke before that happened. But again, lots of other things could be the could be the issue there, and not you know, not the thing that everybody points to. Oh, rotaries can't do that, or which we know they can. I haven't seen them in, in racing. Um, turbo rotors also, it, you know, if everything's right on it. But what what is the usual kind of boost level that guys run on the street? Do, do you get you know I know. I know when I get comments whenever I do a turbo application, say, hey, look, we ran seven pounds on this. We ran 10 pounds on this. Why don't you turn it all the way up? You need to go all the way up. Everything isn't about going all the way up. The guys that want to go, the, the guys that want to pin the gate and and max out the turbo or whatever are the guys that always have broken engines. That's <laughs> broken motors, too. So for the people that are engine and motor guys that you can't say one or the other, I ha I'm going to say both. Um, those are the guys that have broken stuff. So because, because if you turn it all the way up, once you do that and you try to max the turbo out, 
just like trying to max out the supercharger, it gets more and more problematic the closer that you get to that end level. It's just things get unhappy, it gets hotter, the belt slips on blower applications, the back pressure gets high on turbo applications, you know, all sorts of stuff that can that can go wrong is, is going to go wrong. If you run it in the happy place, you know, it'll last a really, really long time. But you also would need to size it, obviously, to do that. And the thing is that, here's the other thing to think about is, if you're running seven pounds, 10 pounds, whatever that number is, if you're running that on a motor that, you, that started out making 300 horsepower, you're going to be at like 450 or 520 or whatever the number is for 10 pounds. But if you start out with something that's like a big block, that's making 600, then all of a sudden you're at a pretty good level, even at just seven pounds. You're, you know, you could be at 900, assuming that you're running E85 and you've got enough timing and that kind of stuff. So um, that's the other thing to think about is not just like we were obviously the the pole is predicated upon boost but boost really isn't the thing i mean if we had if we take a stock 200 horsepower v8 which they made plenty of those back in the day um, and you apply boost to it that's going to make it feel a lot better it's going to make it feel if you add seven pounds or so it's going to might might make it feel 40 or 50 percent better which is good which is a lot the thing is, it's just not a lot, relatively speaking, because you can get that same kind of power as we saw from the bolt-ons versus boost. You can get that easily with heads, cam, and intake, or usually if it's an LS with just a cam, you can get that kind of gain. But the the thing is, whatever your starting point is, is going to determine how much power you're making once you add that boost. So Normally, when I talk to people about, and, and particularly the LS, but I'm sure the LT would be the same because it makes even more power. But if you're starting out with an LS and people say, well, what, you know, how much camshaft should I put? How much cylinder head should I put? I tell them to put more camshaft and more cylinder head and more intake manifold on an NA combination if they're trying to make power. If you're, if you have a turbo combination, I usually tell them, look, just keep your stock heads, keep your stock intake manifold, put a cam in it. And just run the boost at wherever you need to run the boost to make the power that you want because the turbo is going to dictate that. If you are limited by octane, if you're going to run 91 or 93, which they have in a lot of places around the world or, or around the, the country, but also around the world, if you're going to limit that and say, hey, look, I'm going to run seven pounds. So if you run seven pounds on a stock motor, you're going to get one thing. If you run seven pounds on a motor that's been upgraded with, and especially with a camshaft, I mean, we, we've seen on LS applications, if you put a camshaft in, even if you're only running seven or eight pounds, you know, you might from the camshaft swap now with boost, you might pick up 120 horsepower. It's a lot. I mean, so it's definitely a worthwhile thing to do something that's going to allow you to make more power. And, and and so here's the question for you guys. Are we still within the same safety margin if we're running the same amount of boost? If we're making more power, like is the, is the detonation threshold the same for a turbo stock 5.3 from the wrecking yard at seven pounds as it is from a cam 5.3 at seven pounds when one of those is making 120 or 30 horsepower more than the other one? is that detonation threshold the same? Is the safety margin the same? Will the motor last as long? Will it do all the things that you want it to do because you've limited it to seven pounds? Is, is the seven pounds thing, and obviously the thing that we think about with seven pounds is the associated um, air temperature, because that's gonna help one of the many things that are gonna help determine the detonation threshold of the combination. Unfortunately, it's not the only one. And honestly, at seven pounds, it's not going to be very hot, especially if it's seven pounds running through an intercooler. And then especially if it's seven pounds running through an intercooler and you have been lucky enough or smart enough to run E85 on it. So you have, you know, you, you did all the right things. You put a camshaft in it, you put springs in it, put the right push rod length in it, um, chose the right mild camshaft in it, have a decent sized turbo. And then you're running seven pounds, you've got an intercooler on it, and you're running 85. So now you have a combination that not only is going to make good power, but more than likely it's going to last a really long time. The other thing that's great about that is that the tuning window on it is like this big. <laughs> you can miss by a couple of degrees of timing 
and still not hurt the motor. You can miss by half an airfield point or more on the airfield and still have a motor. That's the nice thing about limiting boost and having lots of the other stuff that you need. You have lots of octane, you got charge cooling, um, you, you have intercooling also not, you know, we have charge cooling from the 85 and we have intercooling from the intercooler itself. So if, if we keep the boost down low, you have all that stuff, but you can still make lots of power. Now, <laughs> the, that, that's over here. The other side over here is more boost. <laughs> This is a side that speaks to you. <laughs> this is a side that says, you know what? You're right. I got I had I got ahead to you. Seven pounds feels really good. You know it would feel even better. <laughs> More than seven pounds, 10 pounds, 15 pounds would feel twice as good as seven and a half pounds. And so that's when you start getting into trouble. And the thing is, is as you go up and boost, more problems start arising. So let's say that you could even run 15 pounds in your street motor on pump gas. Um, E85 obviously would be a lot easier and, and you should be able to run 15 pounds. And, you, and, and lots of guys have run, I haven't even looked at the numbers, but lots of guys have run 15 pounds on pump gas. Uh, but the problem is when you're doing that, you have to take lots of timing away to stop it from detonating. That's the safety factor. Air fuel usually is the same. It's like 11, 11 and a half, somewhere in there. That's going to be fairly consistent, whether it's on pump gas or race gas or 85. The 85 number is going to be on a gas scale. So you're just, you're giving it more fuel to get the same air fuel ratio relative to the gas scale. So that stays the same. Timing is the thing that you juggle to make more power when you have higher octane. So on pump gas, you got to limit timing. And that's okay. That's a good safety factor. It makes the thing safe. You drive around, you don't detonate. It works. It makes power. The problem is that at lower timing levels, you have higher EGTs. And when you have higher EGTs, you throw another thing in there into the equation that can also actually increase the detonation threshold. <laughs> it could change it, make it more likely to detonate. So that becomes also problematic. Too much timing could definitely be bad. Too little timing can also be bad. So you need that. Um, now I see what's going on here with my mic. So you guys are going to get some mic noise for a second. My little spring clips have come out of there. Let's see. Should help. So hopefully the audio should be better kind of tonight. So that should be good. So that's the thing. Um, I want to see how our poll is doing. <laughs> our poll is split 50-50. 51, yes. 49, no. Do daily driven pump gas turbo motors usually run more than 10 PSI? So half of them are saying yes, it does. And half of them are saying no, it doesn't. Uh, I, I tend to lean more toward the lower end of the boost scale. But I, I'm not out there around everybody doing this. So... I love the gasoline forever t-shirts. Yeah, even my wife said, no, I like that t-shirt. That, that thing's cool. So I'm Fry Freiburger will be happy to know. GM's factory one. The GM factory guys can get the tune. They spent a lot of time on the tune, making sure that it works and that it's safe um, at a variety of different boost levels, obviously. So it's the the Volkswagen guys, well, everybody, because every, almost all the manufacturers have some kind of factory turbo motor that they're doing and it works good. Um, so that's the thing is that um, we, if you're, if you put a turbo motor together, a, an LS or a Dodge Magnum or a 4200 Atlas or whatever it is, and you're running it on the street, do you purposely keep the boost low <laughs> so that it's safe? Um, Cause that's the other thing is that if you, make a mistake if your fuel pump's going out, if your filter gets clogged, uh, if your timing is wonky for whatever reason, maybe sensors are going bad or something like that, um, and, and something does potentially happen, then having the boost lower obviously gives you more leeway for, <laughs> for catastrophic problems. Um, and with the, when I had the blower on the Vortec, the thing that was nice about that, that I will have to say is having a supercharger on there is that 
as much as we would have maybe wanted to be able to turn the boost up, especially when you were getting ready to race with somebody, as as tempting as that would be, like on a blower deal, you have to get out and change the pulley and then retention the belt and do all. That. So you're not you're not really going to do that. You're not really going to hop out at a light or whatever and and try to do that on a turbo application. If you just have a controller or whatever, that's a pretty easy fix. Or if you have the little uh, Coca Cola <laughs> lid, the tab that uh, that they use on Fast and the Furious with it with a little string on it, so you pull your vacuum line, then you can do that also. But we couldn't do that with a supercharger. So the supercharger kind of kept us uh, safe and honest as long as you had it. Like I said. Um, and the, the, thing, the nice thing, I guess, for, for street use, especially on pump gas, because I even ran 87 in the Mustang a lot of times, although mine was only eight and a half to one because we put um, dish pistons in it, the forged dish, dish wise goes in it long way back. Um, but the nice thing about it is that it's the pulley is fixed and you're not going to, you know, change the boost. And also with a centrifugal blower like we had at Vortec on there, we have a rising boost curve. So we don't have a whole bunch of boosts down low or in the middle. We only have the high boost at the top i'm gonna have to i'm definitely gonna have to adjust that uh through our welding fabrication you run 28 pounds on your daily driver variable boost and spark would be a great option with a turbo that's all doable that's the nice thing about turbo stuff Yep, hold on, bro. Let me turn the boost, pull the tool bag out of the light. Yeah, and you and you got a guy like wrenching on it to get the belt tension that you need to, so it doesn't slip. It's a it's a little bit of work. Uh, a Dodge Cummings, yeah, a turbo diesel is a whole different thing. Does anyone know if a Roush Mustang uses a standard Ford supercharger intake manifold gasket? Are you talking about the gasket between the blower and the intake manifold or between the intake manifold and the head? How come nobody makes a CVT style drive with a centrifugal blower? Procharger actually does, but they make it for a fairly small unit. Boost safety stuff on the street, like knock control. We had, uh, well, we didn't have knock control. We didn't have any detonation. We didn't have any knock sensors on the Mustang. Um, or on the sprint that oh, we might have had a knock sensor on the sprint i'd have to go back and look and see um but definitely not on the mustang texas speed cam stage texas speed stage 2 l6 springs l7 lifters anyone have a similar setup no, there's lots of videos up on that kind of cam run on a. Is the what is the lift on that on that stage two Texas Speed cam? Because an L6 spring is only a 550 lift deal spring. I saw 17 psi on a 2013 Ford EcoBoost. Uh, Brian, so you run 15 to 23 pounds on your daily driven Reliant. Do you, do you run that on pump gas? Can I put a turbo on a stock L59 Vortec 5.3 without upgrading parts? You don't have to upgrade any parts. You, if you're going to run lots of boosts, you should put ring gap in it. Cam test to GPI SS1 through 4 versus BTR stage 1 through 4. I think that they've already done that test. I am going to be doing more Atlas content. Water cooled turbo versus oil cooled. Actually, a water cooled turbo is also oil cooled. They they they're going to um, lubricate the center section with oil always, and then the water cooling is just in addition to that. Does lower intake temps through the use of water methanol and intercoolers help the motor that doesn't have ring gap live, live longer? It, if it brings, <laughs> maybe, if it brings um, ring temperature down, but only if that, ha if that happens. I have a friend that doesn't believe in blow-off valves and wastegates. What applications 
can they be deleted? What do you mean he doesn't believe in them? Does he not? Does he believe that they don't? He doesn't believe that they exist, or doesn't believe that they work. The the applications where you could use it is if you used a really small turbo that was limited in airflow so that it could never make as much enough boost to hurt the motor. Or the other way they used to do it was limit it by having it be a draw through and limit it on um, inlet size of the carburetor that they're doing. And a blow off valve is not used on some applications, um, but it's a good way for your turbo not to live a long time. Have you ever done any intercooled roots testing? Lots and lots. Does it ever get to the point where heat soak overpowers the inner core? Um, heat soak is actually a myth. That that's not actually a real thing. <sighs> if you have an air to water um, inner core between the roots blower and the motor, then and you have a good enough supply of water, then there shouldn't be a heat soak problem. Have you ever tested any no springs required cams from VTR? No, Brian is supposed to be sending me one of the NSR uh, Chuck Norris cams, but I don't think I've run any of the others yet. My GTX had a knock, knock box, ran 15 to 18 pounds all the time on pump gas, 8 to 1 compression. RX-7 fuel pump. Variable veins don't use blow off valves or waste gates. They don't use either one of those. They're just controlling it with the with the pitch of the veins. Have you ever thought about running a junkyard turbo test? Um, we've run lots of junkyard turbos. The the five liter, um, I think Ed, the guys uh, from Muscle Mustangs did a, did a test where they ran two of the SVO Mustang or Turbo T-Bird uh, turbos, ran twins of those on a Fox on a five liter way back. But you can get turbos off of the a lot of the turbo diesel applications and run them. They're not ideal, obviously, but they are a turbo and they will provide boost. The problem is that anymore getting, I don't know how cheap junkyard turbos are, and then you usually have to fabricate something to make them work, like a flange or something. And the turbos that are available online are just so inexpensive that you can get a brand new one. What was the average cost to do an M112 supercharger on an LS? The most expensive thing is the is the intake manifold and adapter for an M112, but you wouldn't want to put an M M112 because there are lots bigger, better blowers to put on there. I I did a 122 and then also a 2.3 on the LS. Will a twin scroll, scroll 7.3 power stroke turbo diesel spool well with a 5.3? I've never tried that particular turbo, but I would imagine that it would because the a 7.3 turbo uh, diesel is bigger, but it's not very powerful though.
Richard, is boost timing similar to nitrous timing? Minus two degrees for every 50 horsepower? No, it's not. Can you fit a big block on Pantera? Yeah, the the um, I'm trying to think of the guy's name that ran out of Silver State. I ran a bunch of them out there with big blocks in them. His name will come to me. How long till you have boosted Pontiac V8 information? Um, after I get a Pontiac V8, I could, I could have that. Uh, piss and junkie. I'm almost done building my bed for LS7 427. I want to make a thousand rear wheel horsepower about a pair of GTX 3576R Garrett turbos. All my buddies say they're too small. What do you think? Uh, I'd be a little worried maybe about the hot side of those, but I think that those turbos will support more than that. You need a TBS 2300 or 2650 for an LS. Kenny Bell Whipple Twin Screw. All those will work. The, this Pantera that I had, I wish I could remember the guy's name. He had some um, SVO. Uh, first, he had a crate engine in there. Then he had a built one. But it was 500. It was like a 514 to begin with. Um, and it went really fast. It was a more than 200 mile an hour Pantera. Richard, do you have an equation for a horsepower torque to curb weight? Something you personally feel is enough in any size car, truck, or van. It's going to feel differently if you have a really heavy car. Even if you have more power and you have a real heavy vehicle. Actually, I think that that's worse. <laughs> because if you get a six or 7,000 pound vehicle really going quickly, um, then you worry about being able to stop it. It becomes much more of a problem. Or does it stop? Does it handle? Um, you could, you know, if you put a thousand horsepower in anything, it's going to be really, really fast. But um, there are uh, horsepower to weight ratio calculations, and guys have their own numbers that they think, you know, work well. Uh, honestly, in a 3,000 pound or less car, even if you have 500 wheel horsepower, it's going to be really, really fun. I, I like the way the Panteras look there. I think that they're, I, I've always liked those. I, I like the way that the engine looks. They guys detail these things, put turbos on them, blowers, whatever. Um, I like that they use Cleveland's in a lot of those. Um, these were big blocks. Um, lots of them broke down <laughs> the Silver State with, must have been cooling problems, but they are really cool looking though. Twin M90s, that would be good. Or Mangusta, yeah, that would be even harder to find. I've seen some stuff on Facebook about a guy doing um, some double throwdown 2650 stuff. Um, some new ones, he's buying rotor packs and making his own combinations. So we'll see if anything ever comes of it. Yeah, Jet Black, when they have uh, downdraft Webers on them, they look really cool. Remember when Hellion did turbos on top of a blown Shelby? 
Um, did they? I remember when they did the the Cobra, the the Terminator. I don't. Did they do a Shelby also? Uh, crypto cars and copy. Richard, Richard, would you be willing to look at a new tune on L7 build via HP tuners? I, I don't, I'm not a tuner, so I wouldn't even know what I'm looking at. I don't ever tune with HP tuners. Uh, I, everything that I do on the dyno is always, um, is always Holly HP or, um, uh, MS3 pro now, but the Holly HP or, or, um, dominator. Terminator X or Factory ECU re retune. Both of those actually work very well. I mean, if you look at what Matt over at Sloppy's done, they've got lots of cars that are running really, really fast with a factory ECU and harness. And just he's got, he's got the cool thing is that he's got like a cabinet full of tunes that you just select one and put it in. And if you have the right size injector and the right pump and that, that part of it all is all working, it just goes out and makes the number. So it's really pretty impressive. I had my choice of 5.2 Voodoo would be a great motor for the Pantera. I think Mahovitz long ago had a Pantera and was going to put a modular forward in it. An L7 block with stock sleeves and a crank with upgraded rods and pistons handle 1,000 wheel horsepower. And not a lot of people don't like L7s for boost because of the thin sleeves. I'm, I'm worried about all of those factory aluminum blocks except for the 5.3. Is a GT35 too much turbo for a street duty Duratec 2.5 in terms of boost? Well, a GT3582 is like a five to 600 horsepower turbo. So is that is that where you want to be? It's sized pretty well for a 2.5 liter, especially if it's a good one. Uh, Jay, you would get uh, a lot more from boost than you will from displacement on any kind of combination. Richard, would you pull low horsepower numbers on a freshly built engine? I don't know what you mean. Callaway factory Corvettes. Yep. And the factory tune port deals. Dan wants to know what IndyCar had a V12. That that would have been way back, right? How much can air filter size matter for NA motors? It, it does. I mean, you have to have enough airflow for to support whatever power level you're at. Callaway twin turbo it stayed king for years. It said the king of what? It it didn't did it go as fast as a zero one did? Yeah, we're all we're all worried about the big end. <laughs> the the cool thing about the Callaway is that it had um, like a massive amount of torque, but but not a lot of horsepower. The zero one C four five and six were far slower and never hit two hundred. No, uh, uh, a zero one, the C four zero one was a hundred and eighty mile an hour car. But a Callaway um, twin turbo was not a 200 mile an hour car either. Not not even close. It, it was it was either less than or right equal to a ZR1 of, of the time of that time period. Why does a two valve four six get so much hate? I wrote a book about them, so they don't get any hate for me. I 
how do diesel turbos act on gasoline engines that are revved up? Well, first of all, the turbo has no idea what kind of engines that it's on. It doesn't make any difference. The thing that you need to be concerned with is the turbo, from a turbo standpoint, how much does it flow? How much does the hot side flow? And how much does the cold side flow? And is that enough to support the power level that you're asking it to support? And then does it have enough hot side flow to then <laughs> flow enough for that boosted power level? Yeah, the factory Callaway was 380, 385, something like that. It was less than a, a 386, I think, was the number, if I remember it. I, I don't know why that number stands. Three hundred eighty-two horsepower and five hundred and sixty-two foot-pounds of torque. That's why it wasn't like. Um, that's why it didn't have the top end charge. And <laughs> that's right, I forgot. I forgot it had the two uh, two extra injectors um, positioned right in front of the throttle body and stuff. I forgot about that. That was interesting. <laughs> it's good stuff. But that's why, I mean, the the ZR1 actually made more horsepower. So when you're talking about speed, top speed, that it's it's horsepower versus aero. Tin port Callaway sledgehammer, 250 miles an hour. The factory uh, Callaway twin turbo Corvette never went that fast. Only this, only the specially built sledgehammer car did. Can't wait to see more Atlas testing. Me too. I'm excited about that. The Grand National is unique for its time. It was the, I had a, I, and I still have it. I had an 88 five liter Mustang. So at the, at that time, uh, you didn't mess with the Grand National. <laughs> they were fast. I went for a ride in a new Shelby GT500, 760 horsepower. They're, they go pretty good. They're, that's a lot of power. Uh, Brent, yeah, Richard, I've been thinking how everyone's going to turbos and pickups. They're trying to replace the bigger V8 stuff with smaller motors and boost so they could get more fuel mileage. That's like the EcoBoost stuff. That's why they're doing that. But yes, you could run a turbo on your small block Chevy. The critical element is just the tune, especially for a towing application. Yeah, Andy, a new LV3 does make more than a Grand National. In fact, it made more than makes more than the GNX did. Most people don't know that if not for the Grand National, that we would have never had the cyclone or the typhoon because it was the Buick guys that built the prototype. So that's cool. Can an LSA supercharger fit an LS9? Yes, but with only with the right intake manifold. So Walmart, so you saw the LB3 or LB1, LB3 heads flow like 240. That, that's it? That's all that they flow? I thought that would be more than that. I still would rather have the GNX. They are really cool. <laughs> oh, yeah, I would rather have one of those than, than a stock LB3. And the Trans Am, yep. <clears throat> Because then they finally put it in a car that was at least aerodynamic.
Alan, you're running 13 pounds on a stock engine, daily driven Toyota Sorter. Okay, cool. And 13 pounds from a TVS also on there? That's kind of cool. <clears throat> I definitely expected that to be a turbo. So Travis, you think that most of the motors are <laughs> most of the motors are not V8s? Still at 51% yes and 49% no. So it's just vacillating back a little bit one way or the other. And Richard, can you do a comparison of multiple different intakes for the LT1? I don't know how many different LT1 intakes are available. So they, I know Edelbrock used to have one. There is the factory one, obviously ported factory ones. There was a, um, I tested the Lingenfelter um, Super Ram. Was that what that was? Um, there's one of those. Uh, what else is there for the LT? The, there's probably a mini Ram, but that's going to be real comparable to the factory one. How much crank horsepower should an L77 with a two? What is it? I need to look that up. L77, four inch bore and a 4030. Let's see. So that's just a six liter. So if you take a look at the videos that I have up on six liters, you'll find something that has a cam like that. Most daily driven motors with turbos are not V8s. Uh, I would say the question was not, not factory ones. Um, so engines that were originally NA that guys put turbos on is kind of what we were talking about. Building a two valve non PI with PI ported heads, comp stage two cams, the springs and keepers. What horsepower do you think I'll get? And compression. Uh, I don't remember what the compression is. You can get, look in Sean Highland's book or you can look that up and see what kind of compression you'll get. Um, I don't know if I've run the stage two cams with that, but take a look at the videos I have up PI ported heads, and I think I've used the 274 cams. You kind of see where we are with a good intake manifold. I I think that we were 380 or 90 or something. Keith, I, I don't know that I've tested specifically Gen 3 and a half rods. Not, not in a big bang thing, I don't think. I don't think that the six liter, I think the six liter was just Gen 4. For the torque storm on a 454LX, uh, you're going to be really hard pressed to make eight pounds of boost with a torque storm on that motor because it's like a 700 or 750 horsepower supercharger. Do you like the new LT more than the LS? I, I don't like either one of them more than the other. I, I like them both because they're just more motors for me to test. Richard, do you have any 400 combinations for Mopar 360? N no, because I've never, um, is it an LA 360 or is it a Magnum? I'm not trying to get that with it. Parking lot rebuild, cam headers, and lots of well-guided porting. 
Yeah, you're going to need head work to get there and a decent sized cam and a 360, but a 360 should make 400. Uh, I try to remember what cam you have. Oh, I think we put like a 224 cam or something in the, in the 360. Um, and with the Edelbrock heads, I want to say it was 385 or something, but they really needed porting because they didn't really do anything more than the stock head did. So we got 205 people here and 109 likes. So people need to people need to hit the like button. Uh, I'm not seeing 200 likes. I'm seeing 200 people here, but not 200 likes. Do you do any nitrous testing? Lots and lots of nitrous testing. Does your dyno shop, I don't have a dyno shop. I just test at West Tech, but they do have a uh, an air monitor. <laughs> we have an, uh, an air turbine that we can mount on top of carburetors that we've done that a lot of times. So it will tear it, it will tell you airflow. It's not the PSI, it's the system. That's what's so funny about engines, like temperature and power generation. <laughs> when I was in Japan, life started at one bar. How would you compare a mild 4.8 to a stock 95 LT157? It, the 4.8 is going to make less torque, I think, than a 5.7 is going to be. What's a safe shot to run on a Gen 4 6 liter? We ran 300 shots on Junkyard 5.3s with cams in them. Uh, I don't recommend that, especially like we did without changing the ring gap. <laughs> But 100 or 150 is probably fine. I have a sloppy stage two cam for my six liter. It's a it's a 6.7 fully forward. So is it a 408 or something? LS3 heads and intake. What boost is recommended? The boost has nothing to do with the combination that you just described. The you, you can run as high a boost as you want, especially if you have forge rotating assembly and I'm hoping that you put enough ring gap in it. And then the boost now is gonna be a function of your tune, your injector size, your fuel pump, mostly your tune, <laughs> your intercooling. Uh, I, I, if you, I don't know if you're running E85 on it. Ever tested second gen Ford Lightnings, yes. You gonna be on Engine Masters again soon? I don't know, they just ask me randomly when whenever they need something. I remember the flat earth day of the 90s here. You just stepped off the edge at 12 pounds. And that's when the sea monsters would get you, right? A uh, six liter board 30 over is not a 6.7 liter. So is did you put a four inch stroke in it too? That would be a 408. Let's see, a while back you compared a Gen 3 to a Gen 4, and when one made more torque down low, it popped the bottom end and the variable valve timing. With the variable valve timing of the LT, will the boost have to be ramped in? I think the boost should be ramped in anyway. The Those two combinations were were pretty different in the, in the components that we use for them, not to mention one being a Gen 3 and one being a Gen 4. Um, I don't think that you should take those two tests as absolutes for, for torque production, for one being stronger than the other. It's, they're just some kind of data point. 
but on a on an LT, more than likely, if you put camshaft in it for doing a big bang, you'd get rid get rid of most of the VVT anyway. But yeah, and and you would ramp boost in if you want to do it properly. But that's the way that we should be doing it on the um, big bang stuff. How big was a six liter block with a four eight crank and rods? I don't know. I've never run that. I ran a I ran a six two block, a, an LS three block with a four eight crank, and uh, custom rods, and then custom pistons. And I think it was three hundred and thirty something inches. My former boss put a Whipple 245AX onto a 6V53 Detroit diesel, but the blower turned out to be way too small. You do need a lot of processing <laughs> for that. What's the most cost-effective way to control boost level? If you're talking about doing it on a turbo, obviously, then a wastegate is the best way. Jonathan, for my 360, the cam is going to be a huge whiplash. 226 and 230 something is a good size cam. That's kind of what I'd be thinking. I, I think, honestly, it should have more lift than that because um, I think that those heads, especially if you do porting on them, I think that they're going to keep flowing higher than that, and I think that you could pick up power with more than 510 lift. But if that's the cam that they have, I would try it. Maybe, maybe think in the back of your head, maybe rockers later on. The bots are back. Oh, they are. You got to get rid of these bots. Hide users on this channel. And you are done. I'd like to see more roots blower testing. 871 to 1471 on a 502. Uh, Brent, there will be benefit going to a 1471 if what you're wanting to do is utilize what a 1471 has to offer. If you only want to make eight or 900 horsepower, which an 871 obviously will very easily do, then there's no reason to go to a bigger blower. You, you size the blower so it's responsive and then so it's working in its range, then there'd be no reason to put a bigger one on. If you're wanting to make 1500 or 2000 and then you're going past where the 871 is comfortable, then a bigger blower is going to work. Uh, crypto, I, I don't know. What is an LS7 um, injector flow? I don't know that that's enough for what you're talking about there. Richard, what is the red uh, car on the shelf behind you? The, I don't see a red car. Of this one, maybe? This one right here is a Lotus, if that's the one you're talking about. This right behind me is a red hat. <laughs> that's, a, that's the 200-mile-an-hour hat for Bonneville. But the other one is, that one up there is a Lotus. You ever run any Porsche stuff? I have owned a couple of Porsches, but I never run any on the engine dyno. We ran them on the chassis dyno, though. <laughs> Jonathan, you're so that your idea if you win the lottery, you're going to make a custom intake, put an 871 blower on it on an uh, extremely modified International Harvester 392 V8 and put it in the scout. That'll be perfect because it'll all stick out of the hood and it'll be awesome. Um, let's see. Which heads cam and intake would you use for an engine master's build on a small block Ford five liter if you did it nowadays? 
uh, I don't know. I don't, it, it would depend on what the rules are. The, there's a lot of good heads. The CHI stuff is really good. Dan does Porsche stuff. Do you, do you do, Dan, have you run those, any of those Porsche motors on the dyno, on the engine dyno? The gas prices are coming down. They've been coming down a lot by us. There any chance of testing a 305 or 510 Whipple on anything? I don't obviously don't have either one of those, so I don't know. Yeah, 200 mile an hour hat. You get the red hat if you break a record at 200 miles an hour, Bonneville. Roughly how many pulls did you do on the Big Bang 351? Um, I can take a look at that and see. Let's see here. Luckily for me, I have all of my data. Dino results. We will go to small block Ford. 351 turbo. Uh, Big Bang 351. Uh, it looks like 55, 55 to 60 runs somewhere in there. And the only reason it disassembled itself is because we, and by we, I mean me, <laughs> did some dumb things when I was trying to get it to control the boost. Uh, what are your thoughts? Make, make sure you don't use the word thoughts when you're asking a question. In the in the future, uh, pushing Alice, a four-inch stroke, pushing the pistons and having too much pistons left. It is a real thing on a factory sleeve length. You don't want to do that. A four-inch stroke crank is usually fine-ish. Um, the 4100 stuff and the 4125, I don't ever use on a factory piston. I mean, a factory sleeve length, except for the LS7 sleeve length, I think is longer. But the um all the aftermarket the dart and stuff allows you we put four and a half inch cranks on those richard have you ever tested msd ls intake manifold yes many many times any five threes that have better pistons for spray N no um i would use a gen four because the i think that the piston and rod assembly is going to be stronger um but the, there's no piston design that's going to be better for spray. That's not a real thing. What you want is to make as much power NA as you can, because then whatever nitrous you're adding is going to add to that NA power. Yeah, I don't know crypto. I don't know what the, what is the, um, let's see. I'll do a search here. LS7 injector flow rate. That's an LY6. LS7 is flow 42. So 42 is enough to support a fairly decent amount of power. Forty-two times sixteen. Um, 672. So if you're going to be beyond that, <laughs> um, that's at a 0.5 brake specific, which I'm an LS is going to be better than that. Um, and if you add, if you put screwed a little bit of fuel pressure to it, then you probably could get away with what you're trying to do, but it's going to be right on the edge. It, it would be better to put fifties or something in there or eighties. Then you're only at, you know, 50 or 60% due cycle. Is it bad to do pulls on a fresh motor? Does it have to be broken in? We all, if we have a brand new motor that's just put together, we always run them through a break-in cycle. Any word on a Big Bang stock 392? I've never seen a big a stock 392 in the wrecking yard to be able to to be able to do a big bang on if you're talking about a Hemi, that would be cool. But all of the Hemis that I see in the wrecking yards are the equivalent of seeing a 4.8 or a 5.3 for an LS, which is the other ones that I see. I don't see 6.0s. I don't see 6.2s. I definitely don't see 7 liter LSs. 
and I see lots of five sevens and I don't see any six ones or six fours <laughs> in the wrecking yard. I've never seen any. I've seen a, a number of five sevens, but and, and early five sevens, not even the later ones. I have you we've used the truck coils a lot on the dyno and they work well. The ones that I like best are the ones that we've run on the big bang stuff, and those were the LS3 ones. Will you ever do a test on four six or five four two valves with ported twisted wedge heads? I thought that I had a test up there because I've run I've run a four six with twisted wedge heads. Trick plus says they flow to 90. Well, the cam is not going to determine what the head flows. Um, they flow 290 on a flow bench. And I think that they do because I think we had a set. I think we I think I had a set that reported by trick flow. They were part of my trick flow or TEA at the time. And so they, they can support a lot of power. What is injector math to horsepower rule of thumb? I can't find that video again. If you just multiply the flow rate, so if it's 50 pounds an hour times 16, that will tell you at a, at a 0.5 brake specific, that'll tell you how much power they'll be able to make. Because it takes um, half a pound of fuel an hour to make one horsepower. So if you just double the flow rate and then multiply it by the number of cylinders and in a V8, that's just the same as multiplying it by 16. And like I said, that's at a 0.5 brake specific, but I've never seen an LS, a naturally aspirated LS that runs at a 0.5 brake specific. They're almost always in the fours. So they'll, they'll make even more power than that. But it's a good rough estimate. Crypto, thank you very much. <laughs> First rings are on me, next trip out. That's going to be when I walk down the stairs. In Australia, the Ford Bear 4 liter and Toyota 4.2 liter inline sixes are well known NA motors that love a good serving boost. I think that that's every motor, right? Turbo Man 351, I run 93 octane with 20 pounds of boost and mix a can of cam to race gas. Is this safe? Um, I don't know what your timing is. So if you don't have any timing in it, then 20 pounds is probably fine. 20 pounds on 93 octane seems like a lot to me. I, I wouldn't ever do that unless I had um, E85 or race gas in it. Jeff, we went with a Ford Stroke and a 4085 uh, bore. Okay. Turbo 5.7 and a Dart or Darcy would be fun. It would be. I mean, you can make really big power with a junkyard early 5.7, especially if you port those heads, put a cam in it. The All of the intakes work good, all the factory intake manifolds. I've got videos up on the early intake manifolds. I like the, um, the car version. Uh, I call it the Magnum intake manifold. I like that one the best. It's got the most runner length and it makes the most torque. If you want to rev it a little higher than the 6.1, works good. The truck the truck intake manifold looks the worst, like just like an LS. It looks terrible, but it actually performs very, very well. But they all work good, and they make really good power. The new Chrysler Hurricane. Is that the six-cylinder that's the twin-turbo deal that they've came out with? Is water is water meth injection better than intercooler? No, I don't believe that it is. Could those JE dome pistons go into a 5.3? The ones that I use on the 4.8 definitely could. It's the same bore size. It's the same um, pin height. Richard, you should join us at Yellow Belly Drag Strip. I really like the name. Thursday through Sunday nights. Might find you some extra content. Where is Yellow Belly Drag Strip at? How long is the shelf life of E85? I don't know. It, it, it depends on if it's sealed or not. I've heard that twin 6262s on an LS run into back pressure issues on a 62 much more than 6267s. Well, if the 67s are going to be bigger on the hot side, it would make sense that the smaller hot side would have more um, 
the smaller turbine would have more back pressure. Uh, Bonneville, what type, what type of gear is when we ran the Civic that's right there, we ran a fat, not a factory one. We ran, we started with a factory non VTEC LS, GS, Integra because it had a, it, it had the, it didn't have a really, really good gear splits, but it had enough. Um, the fifth gear was high enough and the final drive was a 426, not a 440 like they use in the, in the VTEC motors. And we actually had a different final drive made. We had a 4.0 because a lot of guys want to run a lot of engine speed. And I don't like to do that. I don't like to run high RPM, even in a little, well, this was a two liter V series or just, just under two liter V series. I don't like to run a lot of RPM. More RPM to me means more problems. <laughs> more RPM, more problems. So I geared it so that we, if we wanted to run 200 or more, we could do it at a reasonable RPM. The only time in in the fourth to fifth split because it was really big and I and a you know if I would have built a transmission, I would have made the split between fourth and fifth much smaller and then didn't care about like I wouldn't have cared about first gear at all because first gear is just useless. <laughs> all you're doing in the in the in the Civic, all you're doing is part throttling the thing out to get the RPM and vehicle speed up, get the wheel speed up. And then in the top of fourth gear, you could go to wide open throttle. And then what I would do when we were doing uh, record runs is I would pull fourth gear to 8,700 and then shift so that fifth gear didn't drop down out of its happy zone. So it was still making boost. And so it was after VTEC and so that it would pull in the range where it was making good torque and power. And then it would continue to pull up into whatever power level we had the boost set up at. And so that's what we did. I and we ran big tires too. We ran 26 inch tall tires, which is not good either. Ideally, I would have had more transmission gear and a smaller diameter tire so that we could have the car lower. Cause you can see it's got a big air dam on it and it's got more ride height than we wanted, but yet it still went fast. Have you done any windage tray videos? I don't know if I have the videos up, but I did a lot of oiling system tests. I did one specifically when I did my engine master's motor way back. We put a, this was on a dart block, on a dart Windsor block, and we did a Mylodon um, oiling system upgrade. So I did a windage tray. We did a pan, a kick out, all that stuff, and it definitely did pick up power. What does E85 destroy in your fuel system if you don't have the right stuff? Um, it can destroy your pump. It can destroy your lines. It leaves residue in a lot of different stuff, like in your carburetor. Have you ever used darken sleeves in an LS block? Yes, the, the 468 that I did had Darton sleeves in it. We started off with an aluminum LS6 block, had Darton do their magic on it. And then we made a, we combined a 4185 bore and a 4250 stroke, if I remember right. Lots of Toyotas and Nissan V8s. There are, the problem with running different motors than we have available to us now is that we have to make custom bell housings a lot of time or adapters four bell housings, and then we have to figure out trigger, trigger wheel patterns and then make harnesses. And so it's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of work to get a different motor up and running. A uh, D'Integra with that motor, LS five speed B18, a B18 A or B. Uh, Do you run PTFE lines with the 85 uh, with fuel injection and the 85? We don't. Um, I'm just trying to think of what what Westec has on their stuff. We always run after we run E85 on anything. We flush it with uh, 91. 
Uh, was B18C the king or B18C5? The motors that we used when we ran the Civic, one of them was a dart block. The other one was a sleeved uh, B18C uh, GSR block. Yeah, Terry, there's lots of spark plugs there, right? What uh, bell housing pattern does a 3.8 liter V6 have on it? It it has a, we got a bell housing for the V6 and it that one actually bolts on to the, um, to the dyno. It's a metric pattern. It's the same one that we would use if we run the, um, the North Star. It shares that that bell housing, and it and it came from a, a thirty eight hundred um, V six Camaro or Firebird rear wheel drive. Richard, did you ever chassis down your Honda Bonneville car? We did, and it, depending on what boost level we made it, I think on the chassis dyno, we only ever ran it up to, I'd have to go back and look. I think we only ever ran it at 550 horsepower at the tire or something like that. When we ran on the engine dyno, we ran it to 730 or so, but we didn't ever run anywhere near that much boost um, on the chassis dyno or out of Bonneville. I never ran more than 16 or 17 pounds of Bonneville. And we ran 29 on the engine dial. Racing, are you entering the corner under braking? Are you trail braking the car? Have you loaded the front? Have you transferred all the weight forward? And is it doing it on one tire or both tires? Have you taken tire temperatures? Is all that even? I, I need some more information on chassis setup. Because as you see, <laughs> we've been through that stuff. Do fuel additives work for octane boost? I, I don't know what you mean by fuel additives, like, like actual octane boost, the stuff that you buy at the store, or um, like STP <laughs> fuel treatment. The, all, all of the testing I've seen on store-bought octane booster increases the octane by a fraction of one point. <laughs> it's a percentage of one point, not, not 10, doesn't change it from 91 to 101. Can you test the internet lower of the dulcich modified thermal quad? I'm and I know dulcich fairly well, but I'm not I'm not um, familiar with that. What did he do to the thermal quad? That's it's kind of magic. <laughs> what are you saying? Is the back end coming around? Well, that's what I mean. If you if you trail bake into a corner and you have um, front grip. If you're trail braking, you've loaded the nose of the car and the back end was going to want to be light. And so that's why you have to transition off of your trail brake and go back to throttle. Maybe do more of your braking in a straight line before you turn in.
uh, racing, if you're doing simulations, you should um, trail brake less. Do more of your braking in a straight line and do trail, brake, trail braking less and try to balance the car, especially right before the apex. You supposedly knew how to make them outperform the other brands. That's too generic of a statement. The, there's there's no way that that's that that as a universal thing is true, and I don't think Dulcich would say that either. How much power will a stock bottom end L thirty six hold? I don't even know what that is. L36 engine specs. Oh, is that the is that the little V6? Is that the NA version? Is that the NA version of that model? It will, it will take a lot of boost. I don't know where the 2.2 liter head is from David. I sent him a message long a uh, while ago that just said, hey, can you just send that back to me? And I haven't heard from Turbo Monza either. Um, I, I need to get those heads back too. Can I run a sloppy stage two with 317s and stock springs? No, you cannot. You can't run that cam with stock springs. That cam has too much lift for stock springs. How much is NOS is safe on uh, LS7 with cam only? Are you going to change the, the, the cam? Is not, it's not going to care about that. The power output, it will care a little bit about that, but it will care more about the ring gap that you have. Um, racing, you're, I think you're trying to figure out a problem when you should be, um, driving differently. I don't think, I don't think you changing the setup of the car to get it, to do the thing that you're asking it to do when maybe you're, you're up, you're upsetting the chassis by your driving. I would try that and see what happens. Richard, you clearly have enough subscribers to get free parts to test like other channels. So where are the sponsors? I don't know what you mean by sponsors. Do, do, you, do you want sponsors? I mean, I would like to have, have, to have channel sponsors. Smoother is always better. And and you and if you're going if you're driving at the limit, you have to balance the chassis. The driver is part of that balance. It's not just, I mean, some of it obviously is tire and suspension and all that stuff, but some of it is driver too. You if it's not doing what you want it to do, you have to try to make it do what you want it to do. And then after you do that, you have to find out if that is faster. If you're if the adjustment that you made is faster, and then take tire, tire temperatures and see if you're if you are you using all of it. If you're not, then chassis setup is important. And then find out, you have to make sure that you can go out and drive consistently lap after lap. Can you get it on the same second? Can you get it on the same half a second? Can you get it on the same tenth? When you can get it on the same tenth every, every lap, then you're consistent. Then when you make a change and you go, okay, now it's two seconds slower or, or two tenths of a second slower or two tenths of a second faster, then you know that the change did something positive or negative. If you're when you're if when you're driving, if you're all over the board, nobody knows anything.
companies send free stuff to guys like you to review? I don't review stuff. I test stuff. So my channel is not, I, I have, I get people, I have, I get people emailing me all the time, every day telling me, I want you to tell people how great this and this and this is. I'm like, that's not what I do. I don't, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I, the one that I, the one that I wanted to do is like the shave club for men or whatever. I thought, dude, that's perfect. I shave every day or, or almost every day. So that's something I can get behind because it's something I actually use. That's not exactly car related. But but it still is something that I use. But they they only wanted me to show how to shave my face or whatever. I'm like, look, that's not that's not what I do. So I didn't do that. But I get people that want me to show, you know, I get I get the uh, gamer people. Oh, t talk about this game. On I'm, I'm like, yeah, but I I don't play that game, so I don't know anything about it, and I I can't test it, and that's not my thing. That's not what I do. I can't just stand up and say, hey, look use these lights because those lights are cool or, or use this thing because it's cool because I don't want to do that. That's not what my testing regimen is about. If somebody says, here, here's an intake manifold, will you test it? Yeah, I probably will test that. Is rough intake ports and smooth exhaust ports the way to go? I don't think that that makes any difference at all. Daniel, is it worth money to go to a good driving school? Yes. And, and listen very carefully to everything that they say. Try to take notes. Try to do all of it. And then do more driving. Do more practicing. Now you can do driving simulators, which is really cool, which we didn't have back when I was learning to drive. Um, I would go out almost every night in my Mustang, and I and we'd go to Ortega Highway or San Diego Canyon. Um, when I lived in Northern California, we would go. I have a lake that we would drive uh, that we would drive out to back roads on the lake and stuff and do it, you know, late at night when it's safe and nobody's out there. And you would practice, not driving fast, but practicing. So I remember sitting when I was going down to get my um, SCCA license for the first time, I remember sitting in my car and my Mustang, practicing heel and toe shifting, just sitting there in the car and with, with the car wasn't even on or anything. It was just me practicing for hours and hours so that I could get it right. And it takes a lot. If you want to learn how to drive, it's a it's a really really good skill that you that will that can save you time and time again on the freeway. You as you go out and race, you get more comfortable being around other people. You're like, I don't care that this guy's right next to me. If he wants to click mirrors, I got no problem with that because I I could definitely do that with him. And so your your safety bubble becomes a lot smaller. You you learn to look ahead. You learn to read what other people are doing. The good drivers will already know what all of the people around them are thinking and what they're going to do. Oh, that guy's definitely going to cut that guy off. He's going to move. He might clip that guy. If he does, I'm going this way. I'm going that way. You see a big spin in the middle of the rain. You're like, okay, that guy's going to go over. He's going to hit that guy. They're going to pinball off the thing. I should be around them to the right side before that even happens and all the chaos is going to happen behind me. You, you get to know all of that stuff. And the, the cool thing is that you're calm. And that's the big thing because when you're not calm, that's when you make bad choices. <laughs> okay, guys, it's time to end our poll at 55% saying yes, the daily driven pump gas turbo motors usually run more than 10 pounds of boost. Have you seen spark plug wires arc at night? Yes, we turn the lights off in the dyno to check spark plug wires to see if they're arcing. Uh, Frankie, you could run a small wet shot on that motor. We've, we've run 300 shots on motors that we had no idea what the ring gap were. It eventually broke, <laughs> so it's not recommended. But it took a lot of shots before it did it. Uh, Butcher, that's not what's holding up the Chrysler stuff. That motor isn't even together yet. The VS Racing Turbo that I have is good. Just remember when you test retail products that turn out to be good, it's free advertising for that company, deserve to get paid. Uh, yes and no, but the, the thing that I'm most interested in, obviously, is, is providing the information. 
and anybody that I'm going to deal with will get the same speech. If you provide me something, you're not providing me something that I'm going to say something nice about unless it's a good product. If I test it, I'm going to tell people, look, this is an A thing and it did this and this is a B thing and it did this. And so if you want to supply a product for that and you're OK and you have a good product, like it's a good idea for people that make good products because I'm going to test it. And if it turns out to do well, I'm going to tell people that it did well because it did well. But I'm going to tell people whatever it did. <laughs> so if you don't have a good product, you probably shouldn't send it to me because it's and it's not going to do well if it's not a good product. And I'm going to show people what it does whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. And as long as they're, that's the, <laughs> that's a mandatory thing. Like that it has to be that it can only be that. Uh, Cosmic yours will be the last thing in your, See, in your Vortec head swap videos, you ran single pattern cams, the Comp 270H with the exhaust port coming in. The exhaust flow balance is not going to dictate what kind of camshaft you need. You need a dual pattern cam regardless. <laughs> no matter what, a dual pattern cam is going to make more pattern, more power than a single pattern cam. As long as the intake duration is the same and the dual pattern cam has more exhaust duration, it's going to make more power. Um, and if I did that, it's only because that's the camshaft we had laying around that we could put in. It's not because I chose it because it's the best thing or because I thought it was the best thing. It's something that we happened to have that was sitting there. And I'm like, oh, we need to do a cam swap. What kind of cam do we have? Well, we have this one. Okay, guess what's going in? This one is going in. But I thought that we ran a, I thought when I ran that, we ran a 246. A pure energy 246 is kind of what I remember. Is, is that pure energy cam a single pattern cam? It may be. It's a it's really old design. Factory muscle, extreme energy, magnum. The pure energy, the pure energy is a dual pattern, a 203, 212. And did we we ran a magnum cam in it, a 224, 224? I don't I don't remember running that. I thought that we ran an extreme energy to um 264 or 268. I thought it was a 224, 230, but it could be wrong. So I'll, I'll have to look that up and see because I have all the specs on the stuff that I ran. And on, on that note, man, I've been here an hour and a half. That's a long time. Uh, thank you guys all for showing up and hope you guys had a good weekend and I will see everybody on Monday.